Listening section is for 30 minutes and it consists of 40 questions in total with each question worth one mark. So, in this module, you will listen to four recordings of native English speakers, including a range of accents like British, Australian, American and Canadian, and then write your answers to a series of questions. Mind you, the recordings are played just once. Hi all, this is Manisha Narang and welcome back to Leverage IELTS brought to you by Leverage Edu, your trusted study abroad expert. The mock will begin in a minute now. Hope you will do well. Don't forget to comment down your score so in the coming videos you can see your progress. Stay tuned for more content and don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Hit the bell icon to make sure you are notified of all the upcoming videos. Section 1 In this section, you'll hear a conversation between Alan and Gianna, the office counsellor of a company. First, you have some time to read questions 1 to 6. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 6. What's up, Gianna? You look like you're in bad shape. Yes, maybe I'll get sick leave from the boss and finally catch up on some sleep. I've barely eaten and slept in days. Those are warning signs of occupational stress. How are things at work? Terrible. After all the layoffs lately, the workload is totally overwhelming for everyone that's left. So I spend every waking moment in the office. I'm kept busy all the time. So you need to take a few minutes break every so often to clear and refresh your mind. But my boss will complain I'm not hard working. She's so capricious that you can't predict her reaction sometimes. Maybe your boss just doesn't have a clue about how much you're really doing. Keep her updated on your achievements and projects. Also insist that she prioritise everything so you can manage your time better. That's right. I suppose that would help me regain some sense of control. But I'm afraid that she'll take that as a sign of laziness and give me the axe. So take the initiative and hit the job hunting trail now. You'll be surprised at how many opportunities are out there. Well, that's encouraging. Anyway, you should cheer up and get rid of the situation. You know, according to a survey, about 40% of all people find their work very stressful and 25% develop mental or physical diseases. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 7 to 10. So serious? I didn't know that. How do the problems start? You know, they start when conflicts at work induces stress. Your body reacts by flooding the bloodstream with hormones that tense up your muscles and increase your blood pressure. This is meant to save you in a fight-or-flight situation but leads to a host of illnesses, ranging from insomnia and headaches to heart attacks, when it occurs regularly over an extended period of time. What should I do to prevent such things happening? Well, most occupational stress is attributed to a recognised lack of control. You should act in advance to relieve the problems. For example, you should actively pursue career opportunities, rather than quietly worry about getting fired. Of course, you can't control everything, so you need to help your mind and body cope. Keep a journal to release your frustrations, take short walks to calm down, or if necessary, simply take a mental health day. That is the end of section one.
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two, on page ten. Section two. You will hear a talk on New Zealand radio about an art sale which is being held to raise money for charity. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to thirteen, on page ten. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to thirteen. One of the most anticipated art events in Christchurch is the charity art sale organised this year by Neil Curtis. Neil, tell us all about it. Well, Diane, this looks like being the biggest art sale yet, and the best thing about it is that the money raised will all go to charity. So, what you probably want to know first is where it is. Well, the pictures will be on view all this week. Most of them at the Star Gallery in the shopping mall. But we have so many pictures this year that we're also showing some in the cafe next door. So do drop in and see them any day between nine and five. Now, if you're interested in buying rather than just looking, and we hope a lot of you will be, the actual sale will take place on Thursday evening, with sales starting at seven thirty. Refreshments will be available before the sale, starting at six thirty. We've got about fifty works by local artists showing a huge range of styles and media, and in a minute I'll tell you about some of them. You're probably also interested in what's going to happen to your money once you've handed it over. Well, all proceeds will go to support children who are disabled, both here in New Zealand and also in other countries. So you can find an original painting, support local talent, and help these children all at the same time. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions fourteen to twenty, on page eleven. Now listen and answer questions fourteen to twenty. Now let me tell you a bit about some of the artists who have kindly agreed to donate their pictures to the charity art sale. One of them is Don Stubbley, who has a special interest in the art sale because his five-year-old daughter was born with a serious back problem. After an operation earlier this year. She's now doing fine, but Don says he wants to offer something to help other less fortunate children. Don is totally self-taught and says he's passionate about painting. His paintings depict some of our New Zealand birds in their natural habitats. One relative newcomer to New Zealand is James Chang, who came here from Taiwan nine years ago at the age of fifty-six. Mr. Chang had thirteen exhibitions in Taiwan before he came to live here in Christchurch. So he's a well-established artist, and art has been a lifelong passion for him. His paintings are certainly worth looking at. If you like abstract pictures with strong colour schemes, you'll love them. Natalie Stevens was born in New Zealand, but has exhibited in China, Australia, and Spain. As well as being an artist, she's a website designer. She believes art should be universal, and her paintings use soft colours and a mixture of media. Most of her pictures are portraits, so watch out. Some of them may even be friends of yours. And then we have Christine Shin from Korea. Christine only started to learn English two years ago when she arrived in New Zealand. But she's been painting professionally for over ten years, and she sure knows how to communicate strong messages through the universal language of art.
She usually works from photographs and paints delicate watercolours, which combine traditional Asian influences with New Zealand landscapes, giving a very special view of our local scenery. Well, that's all I have time to tell you now. But as well as these four, there are many other artists whose work will be on sale. So do come along on Thursday. We accept checks, credit cards, or cash. And remember, even if you don't buy a picture, you can always make a donation. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. One, exam listening, section three. You will hear some students talking about an assignment. Listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Hello, Tom. Hello, Anne. What have you been doing? Oh, just sitting around catching up with some reading. I've had a great time. You know, we're doing this assignment on what is it? Museums, their costs and benefits. That's <laughs> right. Well, I've been to the Sandgate Museum. It was really good. These local museums are really interesting because they connect people with the history of one special place. We all know about kings and emperors and battles and wars, but local museums tell us about the everyday lives of ordinary people, and that's why they are so important. I'm not so sure about that. I think they are of interest, but they're so small that they can't give a true picture. They do their best. I don't really agree. They do give a true picture, but perhaps not a full picture. It's the truth, but not the whole truth. I think the smallness is the number one problem. Because they're small and local, they attract few visitors. That's why they have so little money. And because they have little money, they can't buy or maintain many really interesting exhibits. As a result, the shop is almost as big as the museum to try to raise money by selling souvenirs, postcards, sweets, and so on. I think they find it difficult, but not impossible. And don't forget, they get a lot of their exhibits free from local people. There was this boat, for example, that was fantastic. Really, what was that? There was a massive fishing boat, a real one, about a hundred years old, and you could walk on it and get the feeling of what fishing in those days was really like. Hmm, sounds quite good.、Hmm. But I've always found that these kinds of museums are a bit dingy. For example, the display cabinets are so dark that you can hardly see the exhibits, and the labels are sometimes difficult to read. Exam listening. Now answer questions twenty-six to thirty. So coming back to our assignment, what we've got to decide is whether these museums should be funded by the government or just by local people. I think it depends entirely on what kind of museum it is. How do you mean? Well, take local history museums. They are small, so they won't survive without financial support. But that should come from the local authority,、hmm. since only people in that area or tourists will visit it. I agree, 
But what about big natural history museums? Surely they should get money from the central government. Why? Children who want to learn about nature can go out into the countryside with their school teachers.、Mm. They could survive from donations, and they get loads of visitors anyway. The state should spend more on science museums, since not enough people are studying science these days.、Mm, I'm not so sure, but I do think a sort of museum which should not get public funds is the craft museum. Yes, like museums of cotton weaving. Yeah, which are of interest to only a very small number of people, and they should pay for it. I agree, but a working farm is a different thing again.、Mm. That's something from the past of all of us, and so it's important to the local community. Kids can learn a lot too. That's the sort of thing that the local government should be spending its money on. Yes, I agree. Well, I think we've got plenty of ideas for our assignment. Section four. In this section, you will hear a lecture on the research on teen brain. Now you have half a minute to read the questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Today our guest is Joseph Parks, medical director for the Botany Department of Mental Health. He's going to give a lecture about the research on teenage brain. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to introduce the new research about adolescent mind, the teenage brain. How much do you know about that? Do you believe in brain scanning? Do you think we can judge whether a teen is normal or mentally ill, or it's just another immature test? The new research shows a teen brain is in the middle of disordered changes. Those changes, scientists now believe, are so significant that they may reveal the mysteries of mental illness, explaining why some teens commit suicide, why others harm their classmates, and why some emerge later in life with mental disorders. The research looks forward to a day when teens could be tested for suicidal depression as easily as they are for heart disease. But there are signs that society and parents, in particular, would reject such a tool. Many parents question the validity of a mental health diagnosis. They fear that their children will be falsely tagged with a mark that he or she is abnormal. At the center of the debate is the teen brain, its confusing architecture, and the difficult question of what's typical in a teen and what's not. Under the old thinking, the adolescent brain was fully formed, needing only to be filled with facts, figures, and experiences to become an adult mind. At the same time, many people rejected the idea that young people were even capable of developing mental illnesses. However, the new research shows a teenage brain is an organ in transition. It has an unstable and vulnerable composition. The evolving teenage brain clearly isn't adult-like until the early twenties. If teens act young and stupid, it may be because brain areas that govern rational thought are not mature yet. All that is fine when the brain develops normally, but if the teen brain fails to successfully reinvent itself as an adult brain, mental illness may happen. Researchers increasingly believe if that process stops for some reason. Teens are likely to develop mental illness. Early warning signs might be disregarded, as adults may think them the typical teen behaviors. 
Perhaps the chief hope of the new research is that it could make a difference for teenagers suffering from mental disorder and major depression. These can lead to suicide, which for years has been the leading cause of death for teens. Until recently, scientists couldn't peer into living brains to look for changes associated with normal development or mental diseases. That is beginning to change as researchers develop ever more sensitive brain scanners. However, the composite pictures are somewhat misleading. A snapshot of an individual brain may fall somewhere between normal and mentally ill. For now, psychiatrists and psychologists must still rely on interviews and observations of children's behavior to diagnose mental illness. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.